Welcome back to The Theology of the Buddy, a podcast for Catholics who love the beauty of the Church's sacred tradition. This is episode 84. My name is Chris, and I'm joined today by my beautiful co-hosts, Mike, Burke, and Tim. Before we begin, if you haven't yet, make sure you hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening, and please leave us a five-star review. It really helps us out. Also, don't forget to drop by theologyofthebuddy.com for all of our show notes and past episodes. You can also find how you can connect with us. Again, that's theologyofthebuddy.com. All right, so we're continuing on in our little series wherein we're kind of sharing when we began taking the faith seriously and uh, not simply letting it become or be something that we received from our families or whatnot, but uh, we really uh, made it our own. This was a question that was asked during our Ask Me Anything episode from Jen Van Awesome. So again, shout out to her um, for creating lots of content for us. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking with Brooke about her story and how she uh, really started to take the faith seriously. But before we do, how are you guys doing? What's up? Yeah, I'm exhausted, but I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> You're looking great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I moisturize. <laughs> <laughs> How's the Strauss house? Uh, well, pretty good. We finished the homeschool year today. Yes. Last All day done. of school. Congrats. And Evie got her, Evie got her end of the year reward. Like for working hard at school. Do you know what she got? She got Pokemon legends and she basically like just would not stop. She was just so happy. She hadn't even played the game and she was just so unbelievably happy. Yeah. That's She's amazing. wanted this game for months. Yeah. Months. So the fact that she finally had it, she's like, I can't believe it. I can't believe I'm actually going to play. I'm so excited. I'm going to catch all the Pokemon. She's six. So this yeah. was like a big deal. So what now, platform granted, is this game on? We have it on Switch. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, I'll be honest. Sometimes I couldn't quite distinguish who was more excited, Evie or dad. But you know. <laughs> if any of you seen that meme where it's like um, grown men when Bug Simulator 3000 comes out? It's just like all these excited <laughs> meme faces. Guys like, oh! That's kind of like me because... As a child, I played a lot of Pokemon. <laughs> it's embarrassing. I shouldn't admit that publicly. <laughs> but I'm just like, the amount of nostalgia in a Pokemon game is a lot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, I also got to see Chris and Julie, Baby John and Baby Therese on Tuesday. Because I turned 31. <laughs> so old. <laughs> Not old. Not old. <laughs> I'm 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 in my prime. I'm still I'm still my early 30s. <laughs> Not my mid 30s yet. <laughs> early 30s. Can can we talk about I, I, mean, I like I, I know that Evie made a huge accomplishment, but something else needs to be acknowledged too. There was something that happened this past week for you, Brooke, that is monumental. Would you care to share? Do you know what I'm talking about? Um. Oh, I didn't cook. I didn't oh. cook a meal. Well, that that's that's one thing. Yes, is that it. But no, no, you uh, beat Mike in Halo. I didn't what? beat him in Halo. I what? didn't beat him in Halo. I thought honey, you said you did, honey. You think I could beat him? Okay. <laughs> Here's what it is. If well, she I, won the bet. I won the bet. I had to beat Mike. I had to kill him 15 times over the course of three games. Oh. It's very doable. Oh, I mean, maybe low. you would that's, know I how to do you, that, uh, but that's I low, do. That's low hanging. Yeah. What? What did you just say? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could probably beat you a good 30 times over the course of like 
three games. But... <laughs> Let's go. Let's go next week. Next I'm episode. <laughs> <laughs> live Halo from live Twitch. Stream. <laughs> yeah. That actually should be amazing. The theology of the done. body does Halo. Actually, oh, this man. episode's over. We were just announcing that we're switching from podcasting to uh, Twitch streaming. <laughs> <laughs> Classic Halo games only. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Um, yeah, but that was pretty fun. Yeah. Mike and I just wanted to have fun and it was great. Can, what did I win? Oh, I got to pick where I got to eat. I it's, can actually do this. I've got a webcam coming where I'll be able to do this. We need to, we need to have a gaming session. Make it happen. Actually though, we could do it. I grew up playing like unreal tournament and quake and doom and battlefield Last, uh, 1942. Bring it. Yeah, Brooke's dad I will. Really into I will whoop you guys in Animal Crossing. <laughs> <laughs> I will have you know that this week I grew the blue roses in Animal Crossing. <laughs> Ooh, I have no idea. Oh, I know. I know. What that means. I'm, I'm breaking it down with genetics Word. on there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hey, we don't have Animal Crossing yet. I really want it. It's a lot of fun. It will eat so much time, though. Mm. I, I, don't, I don't have much time. Danger. I could have got Animal Crossing, but I had to buy you D and D stuff for your birthday. So, whoops, my mistake. <laughs> it's really expensive right now. Still, I'm still oh, waiting for that price drop. It's not going to happen. Mm. It's not. It probably won't. I've heard a rumor that Mike has another birthday coming up here in August. Yeah, unlike Brooke, I am uh, going to be in my mid thirties. The yeah. Ides of August. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 35. Yeah. Wait, isn't that your around your birthday too, Tim? Yeah, yeah. We are a day apart. I'm um, August 14th. He's August 15th. Right. Yeah, Tim's birthday is in the Strauss birthday week, where three out of the four of That's... us have birthdays. So are yep. you? T- are you in the? I guess you'd be in the octave of Tim. It's not Strauss birthday week. It's actually Tim birthday week. We are, we are all in the octave of Evangeline. She's the first season Nine. of ordinary Tim. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nothing ordinary. We don't even have that. <laughs> Ask anybody that knows oh. me. There's nothing ordinary. There's nothing ordinary. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but Sundays after Tim just doesn't have the same ring to it. <laughs> Sundays after Tim. <laughs> Tim oh, Tide. Man. It's Tim Tide. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so. You know, let me die and have Chris? about 300 years and this could happen. <laughs> it could. <laughs> <laughs> Patron saying of face melting metal, you know. This, nice. I, I'm down. So Chris, yes. Um, I was gonna say, what's new with you? Is anything new with you? Anything fun, exciting, interesting? Nope. Start my new job on Monday. That's about it. Very exciting. Yeah. Woo. That's about it. I have an icebreaker, by the way. Okay. Icebreakers. Okay, so Chris, you shared with us when we saw you on Tuesday a little bit of your um, truth left standing. And a little bit of the cringy stuff. Oh, no. Right? Yes. Don't reveal that publicly. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> but I really wanted tea. to ask. <laughs> Don't tell people to search for Truth Left Standing in the Wayback Machine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So today's icebreaker question of the day is What is the worst style choice you ever made? This could include hair, bowl cuts, or I don't know. Yep. Wait, you bowl cut? A, How old were you? Yeah, like fifth grade. It was okay. I had I had like neon pink and <laughs> yellow and green pants. I mean, this this was the age Classic. of vanilla ice. Mm. It was it was not a good time, and I had a carrot top red bowl cut. <laughs> Can you share a pic with us sometime? Please? There is there. Thank, thank God in heaven. 
Thank you. There is no <laughs> no pictures. <laughs> they didn't have cameras back then? Oh, oh man. No. no, they hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Did you know that mathematically you're getting older than I am faster? Because in this next year, I'm only going to live like 142nd of my life, but you're going to live, what is it, 131st? <laughs> yeah. I'm an art major. No. I can draw numbers. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like I'm, an abuse of statistics. <laughs> okay, Mike, worst style choice. Um, mm, I had a pretty bad goatee. It's not that terrible. Chris, mm. was it terrible? No. No. I had really bad glasses as a kid when I first got glasses, which was like grade five, I think. And I had like these ginormous grandpa glasses that were like gold rimmed and they had <laughs> a normal nose guard and then a second one across the top. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Those are pretty special. I need to see those pictures. Yeah. I'm going to go to your mom when I go over, I'm going to be like, Hey, by the way, <laughs> those ones are pretty rare, but I'm sure my mom has a photo of them somewhere. Okay, Chris, I'm sure you have something. I have something I can't wait to share. I, to be honest with you, like, I, I mean, obviously there Man. was, there was the, the time that I put, um, like, so this was when I was in truth left standing and I put, Convenient. um, what was it called? Uh, dreadlock wax at, into my hair to to make it go into the spikes and then had and then I went home and had to try to get it out of my hair and it wouldn't come out <laughs> <laughs> it just wouldn't come out nice. <laughs> oh man the worst part was it, there was this girl named Mallory okay and Mallory was the one that was like hey like this is what you need to do. This is what's going to make your hair stick up and it's going to it's going to look so badass. And I was like, "Okay, sweet. Let's do this thing." Having no idea. No idea. And then I get home and I'm just like, "Mom!" <laughs> it was oh my goodness. hours of How did washing you, my hair. How did you end up getting it out? Hours of washing my hair with baking soda. Um, wow. and I don't know if there was something else in it, but I remember the baking soda. It was like a paste and I just had to just give her for hours. Just, oh, oh man. It was the worst. That I was just was thinking th about the time I had a candle that the wax ran over and it got in the carpet and I had to get a paper bag and an iron and <laughs> do that. I was just picturing your mom, like ironing your head. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I remember, oh I remember when I was a teenager, I was, uh, I, I was helping out one of the priests, uh, at, uh, in, in Elmer. And, uh, he picked up the Paschal candle right after blowing it out and the wax just poured all over him. Just oh, all man. over him. Oh, oh man, it was the worst. Yeah, it is. He had a was beard. he okay? Oh, he was fine. But I mean, he had to go see. Uh, he had some like diocesan event that night, and he was just like covered, oh, no. just covered in wax. And it, like, thank God I wasn't involved. There would have been a high. There, I mean, that would have probably happened to me if I had done it. Um, but like, yeah. Oh, gee, it was a mess. It was a mess. Oh, I felt no. so bad for the guy. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, guys. So cool icebreaker. When I was in high school, I kind of went for a bit of a phase. Like I like to wear heavy metal goth clothes. Okay. Um, and so in high school, my mom bought me this really long skirt. So it went all the way down to my ankles. It was like a denim fabric. It had zippers all over it. And it had like um, chain suspenders that hung around the sides and huge pockets. And I just thought I was the coolest kid ever. Okay. Well, into university, um, I was still wearing this skirt because I was like, I don't want to get rid of it. I still think it's kind of cool. Okay. And 
Also, I was dating Mike at the time as well. So his parents thought I was a true treasure. Um, and uh, so I was on university campus in first year and the zipper at the back of these really heavy like chain skirt pants breaks. And I'm in the bathroom and I'm just like, oh no, <laughs> like it's heavy. This whole, this skirt is probably, I don't know, five, five to 10 pounds of like pure denim and chain weight. So I'm just like, this is a problem. Oh, oh dear. Now I was a weird kid and I had a sewing kit in my backpack because I had it in case of emergencies. Well, I had one safety pin and I safety pinned it closed. And I just thought if I can just get through English, I'll be okay. And I'll just figure it out after that. So I pinned it closed, you know, pray to God, it doesn't open up <laughs> while I'm on the way to the seat. And I take a seat and I sit down and I go through English class thinking, how am I going to survive the rest of the day? This is a long one. And so I get up and I'm basically like, okay, I need to just make it to the student center with this bobby pin <laughs> holding up my pants, basically. <laughs> And so I like somehow managed to shuffle over to the student center all the way across campus. And I'm like, I'm poor. I don't have a lot of money, <gasps> but they're having a spirit wear sale. So hello, uh, UWO Mustang sweatpants. And I bought myself sweatpants. And then I, I think I had to get rid of the skirt after that. <laughs> Don't wear goth clothes. You will drop your pants. <laughs> like, uh, that's amazing. It was the worst. This is a great segue into your uh, actual topic of the night. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. I have pictures too. If I can find them, I'll send them. Not, not of me trying to get to the spirit center. But like, not of like your butt. Just me thinking, these pants are so cool. <sighs> I'm an anime girl. Look how kawaii I am. <laughs> <laughs> really, you just are super but I cringe. Still am. So amazing. So thanks. How? So let's talk about it. What? What's your story, Brooke? Like, where? What? Where did your faith kind of become your own, and you started taking it for for realsies? Oh, right there in that moment, walking across campus, praying that my pants wouldn't fall down. <laughs> You've no, never prayed so hard. <laughs> I did really. I was just like, please, just, I don't want to scandalize anybody. I don't want to, <laughs> why did I wear these pants? Okay. Um, so I grew up in a fairly, I don't know, a very similar family life to Mike, I guess, except my mom was the one that was taking us to mass. Um, my dad wasn't practicing at the time and, um, it was basically just mom taking us kids. Uh, we always sat with my grandma and my aunts and, um, I grew up with Sunday mass being kind of a, I don't know, it was a family thing. We always went and after mass, we would always get breakfast together, have breakfast at somebody else's house. And, you know, it was great. Uh, but as we got older, we got kind of sick of it. We got bored and we were not really invested too much in Catholicism. Um, let alone, I had almost no catechesis, um, which looking back kind of sucks. And it really wasn't until I hit grade eight, seven, eight, just before confirmation, um, that I was like, well, if I'm going to get confirmed, then, you know, I should make sure I actually want to. But even then I was even thinking this is not, this isn't quite right. Like a lot of kids were being confirmed, but you knew that they didn't go to mass. They would say it. It was just kind of a rite of passage type thing. All the grade eight kids did it. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of kids didn't really care and I, I wanted to care and I did care, but I kind of felt like I was alone in it. Um, like, you know, I put in a lot of effort to at the time discern who I wanted my confirmation saint to be. And, um, 
I was looking forward to it. Um, and yes, yeah, so I was confirmed and uh, I picked St. Joan of Arc to be my confirmation saint because after a lot of prayer, I just felt uh, that I related to her and I wanted to be like her, I wanted to be brave and strong. And you know, she was French, I was French, so it all kind of made sense, you know. And then I went off to high school and, um, you know, I was still trying at least to be a good Catholic kid. I was still going to mass. I was involved with uh, singing in the Life Teen Choir. I didn't really go to Life Teen, though, as Chris would know, um, because I just just didn't want to. I had, I think at the time I had an undiagnosed social anxiety. I was really quite uncomfortable um, being in crowds of people I didn't know, especially. Um, and I didn't make friends quickly nor easily. So I was really unsure of how to maneuver into that kind of environment. And uh, looking back, I realized that you know, especially the theology of the body, there, theology of the body, <laughs> like the concept of chastity and purity. I didn't have a name for it. It wasn't until university that I knew this was like, oh, this is, these are basic things about theology of the body. Um, so those concepts just kind of naturally resonated in my heart. And once I went off to university and very coincidentally started talking to Mike, where it was like, oh, people actually talk about Catholicism, like young people. And we were able to relatively, relatively young. I know we were young. I was young. <laughs> um, but we were able to share our stories and our struggles. And um, I really didn't quite have a full understanding of things like Eucharistic adoration or the importance of confession or anything like that until Mike and I started talking more. And I saw how important the faith was to Mike and, um, you know, how active he was in, um, you know, his parish and his Catholic community. And I was like, Oh, this is actually important. I wonder like, why and I was able to ask him questions and he would share stuff with me and I always thought that was cool even though I was way less cool and he was interested so <laughs> um I was just invited into this um friendship where Mike wanted to share with me things about Catholicism openly um because I'd been in Catholicism but I had no idea really what it was in its fullness. Do you yeah. remember around that time reading that book about um, Pope Benedict's encyclical? I read the love that satisfies. Yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, I think a Christopher West book about Pope Benedict's encyclicals yeah. on love. I still like it. That's still a yeah. great book for me. It was still such an important book for me, especially because it was like, it tied in, something that like the concepts of chastity with the devotion to the Eucharist. And it was just like, everything makes sense. now. it was like a huge light bulb um, just like turned on in my brain and now just kind of exploded. Um, I never strayed away from Catholicism, even from high school through university, I was still going to mass every Sunday. Um, I was still doing that and I still wanted to be a part of a community, but I was also kind of unsure of how to, I don't know, how to feel welcome and safe in one. Like Life's Teen was still there for a long time. Um, and I just, I just couldn't get there. And then, um, yeah, so I don't feel like I ever walked away from it. I just didn't really have the most full, amazing, devout experience of it growing up. Um, 
And yeah, so when Mike and I were dating, we kind of made it a priority to um, pray together and put our spiritual health and welfare first and foremost in our relationship as we were discerning. You know, we made it a pretty common thing to go to confession and adoration. And I started hanging out with these uh, couple of noobs. I think the names were... I don't know, Christine and Julian or something like that. It's Chris and Julie. Just clarifying. Just just wrecking the joke. Sorry. Okay. (laughs) And uh, I was like, oh, wow, there's another couple that like loves our Lord. And they're all excited and happy and it's great. And uh, they're trying to help me be a holier person. And, um, and yeah, that was quite helpful for sure. <laughs> and, uh, also when we got into doing team orthodoxy where it was like, okay, you have to learn and share basically. So, um, I was put in a position where I had, I had, and I wanted to learn about the faith and I wanted to share what I was learning with other people in a way that I didn't really get to to learn because no one really told me. Um, and I was still young. And at at the time, looking back, I probably (laughs) didn't understand a lot of things still the way that I do now. And there's probably a little bit of cringe there, but that's okay. But my faith was alive and it was burning and it was just, I just wanted to soak everything up even if I was the only one in the family that was really actually excited about it. Cause, and I wanted it to be part of my life and I wanted people to know like who I loved and, and why. And then, yeah. And, and then it naturally progressed after we got married and started to going, started going to the TLM, you know, my understanding of marriage was different than my family's um, example, I guess, um, especially for Catholic marriage. And I I felt that I had finally grasped a concept that I wanted to have fully understood. Like I was able to, I don't know, how to, how to word this. Is it like you found something you were looking for? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. (laughs) The pearl of great price. (laughs) <laughs> yeah it was like oh so now things start making sense and then you know you go through the struggles of parenthood and whatnot and at the time we were still going to the Novus Ordo um and uh but we were at a really solid parish and amazing priest and amazing community and you know similar to Mike's story obviously you know, Anya was a huge factor in that and going to the rosary group, um, was a weekly thing. So we were form, we were part of a young Catholic community basically. Um, and then when we moved into the TLM, it, be, it, it just blossomed even more. Like my faith just grew exponentially into, into ways that I don't think I would have even have fully comprehended when I was younger. Like there's a different, a different, I don't want to say a different right, but kind (laughs) of wait, there are rights in Catholicism. I didn't know there were rights in Catholicism until, I don't know, probably when we were dating and that's coming from someone that had been a Catholic for almost 20 years, right from the cradle. Didn't know there were other rights. I'm pretty sure my parents still don't understand what a different right is in the church. <laughs> but it's so cool. I love it. <laughs> Even though we told them multiple times about going to Eastern Rite liturgies, I don't think they understand what that is. <laughs> yeah. Can I can I ask um, you a quick question, Brooke? So yeah, you yeah. said that you had grown in your faith so much you know, following, you know, getting into a relationship with Mike and then 
you know, obviously getting married and being in that beautiful community. But then you said the, you know, the, the traditional Latin mass really helped your faith to blossom. What does, what does that mean for you? For me, it meant being in an environment where you knew everyone was praying. Like there was a peace there. There was a quiet there and everyone was there trying to be fully present to our Lord. It's not in one where you're attention is being pulled away to your neighbor or, you know, to singing a responsorial psalm or something like that, or I don't know, dancing and clapping. Like everyone was there praying. Everyone was there to adore. Everyone was there to worship and you could, you could see it and you could feel it. And it was, it was so different to be in that environment. So how has that impacted your faith in terms of like your day-to-day life? Like does it, has it affected the way you pray? Has it affected the way you, you know, approach um, like your day-to-day life? Like, Mm -hmm. Um, for me, like my end of the day prayer, one of it includes is just Lord help me to be the best, the best, a better wife, mother, friend, daughter. And I'm so sorry for everywhere that I failed you. And I, and I think that comes from me having a sense of humility, being in the presence of our Lord at mass, like recognizing that we are at Calvary when we're there. Right. And so there's a a deep sense of humility and I don't know. I'm always trying to acknowledge how I failed and pray that I can do better. That's awesome. Does that make sense? Does that yeah. answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. So how, how has it impacted your marriage as a whole? Like your, I would say the, you know, your faith in general, how has that kind of formed and transformed your marriage as it is today? I would say our priorities, like our prior our priorities on a day-to-day basis revolve around us having time as a family and as, as, as and for us to have time as a family to pray. Um, Mike and I know that every day we have to make sure that we pray our rosary with our kids, you know, ideally. Um, and that does happen probably 99.9% of the time that we pray our rosary with our kids but our, the spiritual welfare of our, of our children and of each other is monumental. I think we had like all these things were there kind of in the early days too, Mm -hmm. but it it is a little bit difficult to put a, a finger on like exactly how it developed. It's just like certain things deepen, right? Mm-hmm. Like we always had a sense that we needed to pray as a family, but when did we actually commit to praying the rosary as a family every single day? It was probably two to three years ago. Yeah. But it's stuck that way. After, during the TLM days, for sure. Mm-hmm. I have this thing that I do with my mom and every morning I call her. Every morning I call and I chat with her while she's having her morning cup of coffee because it's important. And I was saying to Mike, like every day I call, I call my other mom, our lady, because I made a promise to her that I would. And I want my kids to call our lady every day. And maybe they'll call me too when I'm old. <laughs> um, Sorry, mom, you're not old. <laughs> um mike in your in your experience i think this would be kind of an interesting question how have you seen brooke grow um in her faith over the course of your you know your time together Mm. um i'm glad you're asking mike because I mean, we are one, so it's okay that you can direct questions to my or myself. It still counts. We are one body. 
Stop it. Who invited him on the podcast? <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, like um, in practical terms, prayer time is a big part of it. Like I never, how to, how to say this? Like being committed to having the rosary as part of our daily routine is not something that like not that long ago, it didn't seem doable or realistic Mm -hmm. to either of us. And Brooke, especially like, with how she deals with anxiety and how important scheduling things is for her. It's, it's a big deal how things are scheduled in her day. (laughs) And uh, it's a big indicator of the priority things Mm -hmm. have when uh, that prayer time is actually uh, a sacred part of the day that um, doesn't get replaced. So hmm, I know that's just kind of echoing a lot of what was said, (laughs) but it is important. If I, if I can interject um, because I've been, I've, you know, Mike and I were, were a couple first before you and you and Brooke were, or you and Mike were. So, um, (laughs) So I'm kidding. Don't bro, bro couple. Is that yeah. bro, just to bro clarify? Couple. Strictly David and Jonathan. <laughs> I look at more like Paul and Timothy, but whatever. Um, <laughs> it's all the it's all the old jokes that you fire at me, Mike. It's it's fine. <laughs> Um, no, like I think one of the, one of the key differences, obviously like you've matured as a person and there's, you know, there's obviously, um, you know, naturally speaking, there's, you know, ways that you've grown that way. But I think I've seen you've grown, um, in, in a number of virtues and, um, and I really do see that rooted in your relationship with God and, um, and I've seen that especially take off when, yeah, especially when you started attending the traditional lap mass. And, and I don't know if that's just causation or correlation or whatever. Um, but, um, yeah, like I just, I, I see that you've grown in particular in, in just the way you love people and, and, you know, you, uh, I mean the both of you, but Brooke in particular, you know, I've really seen, how how selfless you've been and you know uh you know this past year especially for julie and i has been one of the hardest years of our lives and um you guys have been there and brooke you've been there in a particular way and i can only say that that is um has been because you've been rooted in prayer and uh staying close to our lady because God knows that Mm -hmm. you guys uh, wouldn't be (laughs) as patient with us as you've been um, without our Lord. So, you know, I just, I, I know, I just, I feel like that's really, and I hate saying I feel because Father John always shames me when I say I feel, I think (laughs) that, um, yeah, I, I think that you've really just, you've, grown a lot in that because of that relationship with with god and our lady through prayer and um thanks bud yeah god works amongst the pots and pans every meal in a tupperware is a prayer for you thanks and and you just quoted saint Teresa of jesus so that's a that's a double whammy (laughs) thanks Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) You're great, Brooke. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks. Um, My story is so. (laughs) Well, but again, like you said, everybody is different, right? And every, Mm -hmm. everybody's got a, you know, not everybody's going to have a a wild, crazy, you know, Saul to Paul kind of experience, right? It's a, 
Yeah. It's a growth yeah. and God works in the soul of every person differently and uniquely. And, mm -hmm. um, and I mean, there, there were events that I went through and, and stuff like that, but like at the end of the day, it's the same things that kind of got me through them, you know, prayer and just, just straight up talking to God about how you were feeling and what you're struggling with. And, you know, I'll keep going. <laughs> Hey, I have a question. Okay. Do you remember um, going to confession or returning to confession? Was that a moment for you? You know, I think I was doing the once a year type thing for a while. Um, I think once I hit, well, high school, they sometimes had it like on a quarterly basis. Does that make sense? Like every couple months. They would have priests coming in for a day of confession. I don't know if that was the same as the diocese doing their um, 30, three days of confession or something, but I know whenever it was offered, I would go. Um, and then once I went to university and was really starting to get serious about my faith in the, and, um, and growing in it, then I was going on a much more regular basis. I would always, <laughs> I feel bad looking back because I would come in like right after, you know, the nine o'clock mass was over and I would basically like be like, Bishop Sherlock, Father Kaliski, can you please give me confession before mass? Because I wanted to like be in, you know, as best of a of condition as I could before I received the Eucharist. And you could just see them go, ah, okay. <laughs> Bishop Sherlock was always like, oh, yes, okay. So I was like, that's good. <laughs> it's kind of interesting, though, that like even in those days where you'd describe it as like not knowing anything, maybe not being as invested in the faith, you were still going to confession pretty regularly. Probably more you regularly than, you I don't say more uh, regularly than most, but... You weren't as reprobate as me. <laughs> I think for me, it was more of a turnaround, right? Where I suddenly was like, whoa, I need to go back to confession after not going for years. Mm. But see, I didn't understand this, the concept of mortal sin and venial sin in high school, like at all. I just knew it was important to go. So again, it's almost like that, um, by the way, in a real Catholic school, that's in a grade one curriculum. <laughs> that's true. I, I didn't it's know true. what it was in high school either. <laughs> yeah. Canadian Catholic schools. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ta -da. Um, um, yeah. Harkening uh, back to what something that uh, I saw Tim say in passing with regards to the TLM um, was, and I can't think of the exact quote. But it was something to the effect of, you know, the traditional Latin mass allows you to come as you are. And um, I I think I, I was like, I love that. It's so true because, you know, I was even thinking about how you come to our TLM and there's lineups for the confessional, actual mm -hmm. decently long lineups before mass and after mass for confession. Um, and that it's the same group of people. Yeah. Like the same community of people. It's not like people are coming in because it's a normal confession time. Yeah. No one other than those who go to Latin mass goes at that time. Cause it's not a published mm -hmm. confession time in the mm -hmm. parish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but anyway. that being said, you know, you don't see that those kinds of lineups even on the published confession times. And oh. um and I would say that's because the traditional Latin Mass, the Holy Ghost through the traditional Latin Mass, actually convicts the soul of sin and actually does uh bring you into the reality of who you are and who, who it is that you're standing before at mass, you know, mm -hmm. it, it with, uh, I don't know if, if this is your experience, but you know, definitely with mine, 
there was always this, I'm okay, you're okay kind of experience. And, um, you know, and that's kind of, I would say that's a little bit of a broad, uh, broad strokes because certainly that wasn't the case in every parish or whatnot. But I mean, in, in the normal Novus Ordo experience, that was the case. And, um, and nobody cared about confession. Nobody really, you know, um, yeah. So, yeah, I just, I, I think it's so important to have that reality check and, um, yeah. And how much the, the traditional Latin mass really does, even in just its, its language and its eloquence and the way that it approaches God, um, you know, like even if you look at even the traditional breviary, the way that the prayers are formed in comparison to the new breviary, breviary, it's like the new breviary, breviary is so lazy in its, in its formulations. You know, it's Lord, give us this. It's not, you know, recognizing his majesty and his glory and all those things. Right. And, um, and it really gets away from the deprecatory Psalms and things like that. But that's a whole other podcast. Um, so yeah, yeah it only makes, there sense. are a lot more mentions of us being sinful and unworthy and the majesty of God and stuff like that. It was, it was funny that you mentioned the phrase, like, I'm okay. You're okay. I specifically remember preaching about that or hearing preaching about that. Um, that phrase in uh the life teen masses but it was like our priest at the time saying like this is what the secular culture is saying but uh that's not it like we're sinners and you get to confession basically (laughs) but like charitably and so that emphasis was there and it was a difference from previous experience for me um it was like faith was actually being taken seriously a bit even in the novus ordo and that was like bringing me back right like i was able to come back to confession but there's a level of there's a further level of maybe i don't know exactness or um commitment to that i think in the traditional community though like where yeah it's almost like kind of leveling i don't know it's no it's not like being on a different level but it's more like you have a better example around you if that makes any sense it's like you're looking at okay maybe this is how I'll describe it like in that life teen parish, there's a temptation to be like, I go to confession. Therefore I'm an above average Catholic because most people are not going. But when you go to the traditional mass, everyone's going to confession. Everyone's going regularly. Everyone's going at least once a month. And it's so kind of makes you realize oh i'm actually not special i'm not super holy i'm just maybe doing what i should but i should still press on and still like attack my sin and Mm -hmm. still like strive um Yeah. yeah strive to be better because i'm still you know imperfect in any number of ways and and another it took me a while to get there and and another <laughs> benefit too is like like let's say for example you're going to you you want to stay behind and not go to c- communion because you don't feel like you're mm-hmm. either in a state of grace or you're not prepared properly or whatever the multiplicity of reasons are for not going to receive holy communion at a life teen mass i mean I've had it happen a number of times where like, and I remember going actually to uh, a funeral at Mary Immaculate. I don't remember whose funeral it was, but um, they actually called out Julie and I and said, are you coming for communion? And Julie and I were like, no. 
this was during COVID time and they would refuse to allow you to receive on the tongue. Right. So we're like, no, we don't want to, we don't want to go, but they called us right out like in front of the entire Mm -hmm. congregation that we weren't going to receive Holy communion. Um, you know, but at a traditional Latin mass, nobody's watching. And if they see you, they're going good on him. Like he knows <laughs> whatever he's doing, he's doing it for the right reason. You know, like they're not yes. sitting there judging you, but mm-hmm. like you might be literally pulled up from your seat by, by grandma and said, get to communion. If you don't, you know, do it at a normal, normal Novus Ordo. Um, mm-hmm. So there's even that recognition again, that come as you are not, not as you want to be perceived, but come, come as you are. Um, so I appreciated that insight, Tim. Very, very yeah. insightful. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. You're not just all looks, man. That just, I mean, no, no. every once in a while I show up. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, uh, the, the origin of the thought was, uh, Brooke and I were having a little side conversation earlier about just the brokenness of people and, you know, brokenness of ourselves, brokenness of our families. And it just, it struck me that that is really one of the strongest areas for uh, one of the strongest arguments for the uh, traditional Latin mass is that you come in and in a lot of ways, it's like adoration where you come in and there's no rubrics for the laity. I, Mm -hmm. You, you come, you pray, you observe, you bear witness, you worship, but you know, if you stand at certain points, you stand at certain points. If you kneel at certain points, you kneel at certain points, you know, but, and you know, the ones I've been to, there's, yeah, I've got such a small frame of reference for this and it's, it might not be true across the board, but there is a lot of uniformity in posture at the, at the traditional Latin masses I've been to. But, you know, when I've gone in and I've just been absolutely wrecked and I just sit in the back and just watch Calvary from the furthest hill, then it's okay. And nobody bats an eye. But if I were to go to, you know, St. Somebody down the street to the Novus Ordo, then if I'm not holding hands during the our father which i hate don't touch me (laughs) (laughs) if if i'm not doing the kiss of peace again do not touch me then something's wrong you know like you're getting looks you know it's just like you're it's like you violated yeah you violated the community and it's like guys i'm not there at that point i'm not there at that place and you know that's you guys know what my year's been like and, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of reasons why, you know, I have some of those walls and I don't want to hold your hand. And I don't want to hug you. And I, you know, and it's nothing personal, but that's just not where I am right now. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. if somebody wants a fist bump. Sure. You can have a fist bump, but otherwise, but <laughs> yeah, no, it, <laughs> but I can take, you know, I can take that brokenness. I can take, you know, those wounds that I've been carrying. And I can go to the traditional Latin mass and I can meet God in the silence. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that I'm, that's not an opportunity that I'm afforded outside of the traditional Latin mass. Yeah. And that was a huge thing. I noticed going to the TLM because I went from the life teen choir, literally singing, treating my sorrows and days of Elijah, like 30 years after they probably should have stopped. And then going to the TLM where it was just prayerful chant and beautiful hymns. And, um, and it was all, it was all a prayer. It wasn't loud and obnoxious or clappy. And yeah, it was so, it's so different. I, I remember talking to you shortly after you experienced your first TLM and, and I remember it not being a firm cell yet. Um, I wasn't sure. Cause it was all, all I knew was everything else. Yeah. All I knew yeah. was everything else. And now I'm just like, Nope, well, I, I'm not going to jump at the opportunity to go back. 
If I have to go, I will go. Saying I won't. But I'm going, I'm going for our Lord. I'm not going for the music. I'm not going for people to hold my hand. I'm not going to make friends. I'm just going there to be with Jesus. Cool. Don't hold my hand. If I have prayer hands, don't <laughs> grab my hands. I literally had people pulling my hand. I'm mm-hmm. just like, oh. I would throw elbows. Yeah, just, <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so much. Yeah. Oh, I was going to add one more thing to my testimony because Mike was a huge part of it. Ladies, if you want to find a good man, find a man that loves our Lord and wants you to love him too. Mm-hmm. The end. Mic drop. Bam. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> cool beans. All right, you guys. Well, thanks, Brooke, for sharing that. That's great. Next week. Sorry, it wasn't that exciting. Uh, next week, it's me. It was good. Um, so hold on. Next week, buds. it's roast Chris. <laughs> <laughs> literally chris literally chris part two (laughs) yeah so um yeah so uh thanks again to everybody for listening uh we really appreciate it we'd love for you to share your thoughts on um this podcast what has your journey been like um let us know we'd love to hear from you um you can find all the ways to connect with us over at theologyofthebuddy.com um and if you haven't subscribed again, please hit that subscribe button. We'd uh, love for you to continue to be part of this community and hang out with us. Yeah. We'll see you hopefully again in two weeks. Uh, there's no guarantees of that because I'm the worst podcast host. And until then stay, stay chatty. chatty.